Ibid by H.P. Lovecraft. The erroneous idea that Ibid is the author of the lies is so frequently met with, even among those pretending to a degree of culture, that it is worth correcting. It should be a matter of general knowledge that C.F. is responsible for this work. Ibid's masterpiece, on the other hand, was the famous O.P. Sit, wherein all the significant undercurrents of Greco-Roman expression were crystallized once and for all. And with admirable acuteness notwithstanding the surprisingly late date at which Ibid wrote, there is a false report very commonly reproduced in modern books prior to von Schwenkenkopf's monumental Gescheit der Osterheigen in Italian, that Ibid was a Romanized Visigoth of Otolshort who settled in Placentia about 410 AD. The contrary could not be too strongly emphasized for von Schwenkenkopf, and since his time little wit and Betanor have shewn with irrefutable force that this strikingly isolated figure was a genuine Roman, or at least as genuine a Roman as that degenerate and mongolized age could produce, of whom one might well say what Gibbon said of Bothius, that he was the last whom Cato or Tolly could have acknowledged for their countryman. He was like Boethus and nearly all the eminent men of his age of the great Anician family, and traced his genealogy with much exactitude and self-satisfaction to all heroes of the Republic. His full name, long and pompous according to the custom of the age, which had lost the trinomial simplicity of a classic Roman nomenclature, is stated by von Schwinkum to have been Caius Anicus Magnus Furius Camillus Amelius Cornelius Valerius Pompeius Julius Ibidus. Though Little Wit rejects Amelius and adds Claudius Decius Junianius, whilst Betanor differs radically, giving the full name as Magnus Furius Camillus Aurelius Antonius Flavius Anicius Petronius Valentianius Aegidus. Ibidus. Critic and biographer was born in the year 486, shortly after the extinction of Roman rule in Gaul by Clovius. Rome and Ravenna are rivals for the honor of his birth, though it is certain that he received his rhetorical and philosophical training in the schools of Athens, the extent of whose suppression by Theodosius a century before is grossly exaggerated by the superficial. In 512, under the benign rule of Ostrogoth, Theodric, we beheld him as a teacher of rhetoric at Rome and in 516 he held the consulship together with Pompilius, Numantus, Bombasius, Mercellius, Dermantius. Upon the death of Theodoric in 526, Ibidus retired from public life to compose his celebrated work, whose pure Ciceronian style is as remarkable a case of classic atavism as is the verse of Claudius Cladonius, who flourished a century before Ibidus. But he was later recalled to the scenes of Pomp to act as a court rhetorician for Theodatus, nephew to Theodoric. Upon the usurpation of Vitigus, Ibidus fell into disgrace and was for a time imprisoned, but the coming of the Byzantine Roman army under Belisarius soon restored him to liberty and honors. Throughout the siege of Rome, he served bravely in the army of the defenders and afterward followed the eagles of Belisarius to Alba, Porto, and Sertimasale. After the Frankish siege of Milan, Ibidus was chosen to accompany the learned Bishop Dadius to Greece and resided with him at Corinth in the year 539. About 541 he removed to Constantinopolis, where he received every mark of imperial favor both from Justinianus and Justinus II. The emperors Tiberius and Maurice did kindly honor to the, his old age and contributed much to his mortality, especially Maurice, whose delight it was to trace his ancestry to old Rome, notwithstanding his birth at Arabicius in Cappadocia. It was Maurice who in the poet's 101st year secured the adoption of his work as a textbook in the schools of the empire, an honor which provided a fatal tax on the aged rhetorician's emotions, since he passed away peacefully at his home near the church of St. Sophia on the sixth day before the calendars of September A.D. 587, in the 102nd year of his age. His remains, notwithstanding the troubled state of Italy, were taken to Ravenna for internment, but being interred in the suburb of Claus, were exhumed and ridiculed by the Lombard Duke of Spoleto, who took his skull to King Authorus for use as a wassail bowl. Ibid's skull was proudly handed down from king to king of the Lombard line upon the capture of Pavia by Charlemagne in 774. The skull was seized from the tottering Desududes 
and carried in the trains of Frankish conquerors. It was from this vessel indeed that Pope Leo administered the royal unction which made of the hero nomad a holy Roman emperor. The Charlemagne took Ibidid's goal to his capital at Aix, soon afterward presenting it to his Saxon teacher, Eleusian, upon whose death in 804 it was sent to Eleusian's kinsfolk in England. William the Conqueror, finding it in an abbey niche where the pious family of Eleusian had placed it, believing it to be the skull of a saint who had miraculously annihilated the Lombards by his prayers, did reverence to Osseus antiquity, and even the rough soldiers of Cromwell upon destroying Balloway of Abbey in Ireland in 1650, it having been secretly transported thither by a devout papist in 1539 upon Henry the eighth disillusion of the English monasteries declined to offer violence to a relic so venerable. It was captured by the private soldier Readham and Weep Hopkins, who not long after traded it to rest in Jehovah Stubbs for a quid of New Virginia weed, Stubbs upon sending forth his son Zerubbabel to seek his fortune in New England in 1661, for he thought ill of the restoration atmosphere for a pious young Yale man. Give him St. Ibids, or rather Brother Ibids, for he abhorred all that was popish. Skoll as a talisman upon landing in Salem, Zerubbabel set it up in the, his cupboard beside his chimney, he having built a modest house near the town pump. However, he had not been wholly unaffected by the restoration's influence, and having become addicted to gaming, he lost the skull to one of Epenidas Dexter, a visiting freeman of Providence. It was in House Dexter in the northern part of town near the present intersection of North Main and Olney Streets on the occasion of Canuck's Raid on March 30th, 1676 during King Philip's War, and the astute Sackham, recognizing it at once as a thing of singular venerableness and dignity, sent it as a symbol of alliance to a faction of Pequoits in Connecticut with whom he was negotiating. On April 4th, he was captured by the colonists and soon after executed by the austere head of Ibid, continued on its wandering. The Pequots, enfeebled by a previous war, could give the now stricken Narragansetts no assistance, and in 1680, a Dutch fur trader of Albany, Petrus van Schock, secured the distinguished cranium for the modest sum of two guilders. He, having recognized its value from the half-effaced inscription carved in Lombardic minuscules, Paleography, it might be explained, was one of the leading accomplishments of New Netherland fur traders of the 17th century. From Van Schaak, sad to say, the relic was stolen in 1683 by a French trader, Jean Grenier, whose popish zeal recognized the features of one whom he had been taught at his mother's knee to revere as Saint Ibidy. Grenier fired with virtuous rage at the possession of, his ho of this holy symbol by a Protestant, crushed Van Schack's head one night with an axe and escaped to the north with his booty. Soon, however, being robbed and slain by the half-bred voyager, Michael Savard, who took the skull despite the illiteracy which prevented his recognizing it, to add to a collection of similar but more recent material. Upon his death in 1701, his half-bred son, Pierre, traded, among other things, to some uh, emissaries of the Sacks and Foxes, and it was found outside the chief's teepee a generation later by Charles de la Ronde, founder of the trading post at Green Bay, Wisconsin. De la Ronde regarded the sacred object with proper veneration and ransomed it at the expense of many glass beads. Yet, after his time, it found itself in many other hands, being traded to settlements at, his, at the head of Lake Winnebago, to tribes around Lake Mon Mendato and finally early in the 19th century to one Solomon Yanoi, a Frenchman at the new trading post of Milwaukee on the Menomee River and the shore of Lake Mich Michigan. Later traded to Jacques Cabache, another settler, it was in 1850 lost in the game of chess or poker to a newcomer named Hans Zimmerman, being used by him as a beer stein until one day under the spell of its contents he suffered it to roll from his front stoop to the prairie path before his home were falling into the burrow of a prairie dog, it passed beyond his power of discovery or recovery upon his awakening. So for generations did the sainted skull of Caius Anicus, Magnus, Furius, Camellius, Armelius, Cornelius, Valerius, Pompeius, Julius, Ibidus, consul of Rome, favorite of emperors, and saint of the Romish church lie hidden beneath the soil of a growing town. 
at first worshipped with dark rites by the prairie dogs who saw in it a deity sent from the upper world. It afterward fell into dire neglect as, a, as the race of simple, artless burrowers succumbed before the onslaught of the conquering Aryan. Sewers came, but they passed by it. Houses went up, 2,303 of them, and more. And at last, one fateful night, a titan thing occurred. Subtle nature, convulsed with spiritual ecstasy, like the froth of that region's quantum beverage, laid low the lofty and heaved high the humble. And behold, in the roseal dawn, the burges of Milwaukee rose to find a former prairie turned to a highland. Vast and far-reaching was the great upheaval. Subterrane arcana, hidden for years, came to last to the light. For there, full in the rifted roadway, lay bleached and tranquil and bland, saintly and closer pomp, the dome-like skull of Ibid.